everyone, and welcome to the Malt House Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today, and with me as usual is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. And I'm in love with a strepper. You are. This is episode 165 of the Malt House Games Podcast. We are a podcast all about board games, guard, board games, <laughs> board games, guard games, board, <coughs> board games, <coughs> Board games, card games, role-playing games, tabletop games, things of that sort. Uh, I got strep throat this week and an ear infection. Yes, so I'm in love with the strepper. Delton is going to have to pause this episode quite a bit to edit out some coughs, but you know what? He'll look cute while doing it, so everybody wins. Uh, Yeah, it started Sunday night as I was sleeping from Saturday, about 2 a.m., and then all through the morning with terrible fever on and off and a sore throat and finally got into the doctor which took like three and a half to four hours because urgent cares suck around here, and that's a whole thing. Well, somebody treated the urgent care like a hospital. They did. They brought their kid with a broken leg. And they had to stabilize the leg before they could get an ambulance there or something? The broken kid with a leg. Then they had to stabilize (laughs) a... The broken kid with a leg. (laughs) Yes. Then they had to stabilize another person, I think. That's the story of my life, a broken kid with a leg. (laughs) Yes. Yes, so it took forever... Um, I technically tested negative on the actual test for strep, but the doctor looked in my throat. She was like, no, there's definitely some spots. We've been, we, the nurse even said, we've been seeing it a lot where people have strep, but are testing negative on the test. And you can clearly see the strep. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Somebody come get her. He's looking like a strepper. Yeah. So that's been fun. I'm on antibiotics. Um, I've been fever free since like Sunday night or afternoon. So it's, uh, you know, it's all good. I'm back to work just on medicine and not licking people's food, stuff like that. So that's where we're at. Yeah. Been fun. Very coffee. Now I have a lot of drainage from allergens. Probably need to give Margaret a bath because she's a stinky dog. But being that he's on the antibiotics, we are abstaining from alcohol consumption this evening. And what do we have to drink? Delty poo. We have courtesy of Brian. These are one of his favorite new things, even though uh, as I told him, they're too expensive. Stop buying them. <laughs> it is Hop Tea from Hoplark. Uh, this is their limited edition cream soda. Uh, the ingredients are carbonated water, palisade hops, vanilla beans, and citric acid. It says to keep it cold for freshest flavor. The hoppiness level in this is a wee bit, and it is caffeine free. It says, we took all of the yummy from a traditional cream soda, left behind the sugar, and blended it with Palisade hops to create this smooth and delicious brew. Treat yourself to something special this holiday season. Brian has been not drinking a lot, uh, just on like special occasions or, you know, infrequently. And so he's really enjoyed having these hop lark, hop teas, and hopped sparkling waters around. In Oklahoma, they're not as big of a thing as they are in places like Portland, and so they are extremely expensive. Yeah, I feel like you could get, like, a decent hop water for, like, two bucks a can or something like that in Portland, and this bad boy runs, like, eight or nine dollars a can. Something like that. I mean, it is a 16-ounce can, but still, I told him, because after talking to Nick's friend Brian about how he makes his own hop water, I was like, dude, I have a one-gallon keg and a five-gallon keg, and I think another five-gallon keg. I can make this We'll buy bottled water that you like. We'll buy the hops. We just make some hopped water and I'll carb it for you and I'll set you up and you just use it. Like we can do this and save you a ton of money. And also you could customize it with your favorite hops. You need to do that for Brian's sake and also for your own sake. So you can sell it, make money for your symbols. That's true. I don't think I've tried this flavor. Have you? Yes. What did you think of this flavor? Give us a sneak peek. I am not a cream soda fan. So it's fine. I am a cream soda fan, so I'll be the judge of this one. This is probably the only time when Delton says, hey, you take the one with more. I mean, you can smell there's a lot of hop in there, even though it says a wee wee bit. It is a carbonated fizzy water. There's a taste of vanilla and there's hops. That's an accurate description. Doesn't taste like cream soda. Doesn't taste like beer. Doesn't taste like an IPA. It's just. If this one's very unique. But it's good. I feel like I'm chewing on like a blade of rye. Just because that hop flavor from the Palisade hops? Mm -hmm. It's like hoppy and grassy, but a little sweet. It's not as hoppy as some of the other ones I've tried that Brian's got that are closer to like IPA levels of ridiculous hops. But it is very good, though. 
and the other stuff stuff from Hop Lark has been very tasty. And I see why people like hop water. If you enjoy having a beer, but you don't want to actually have a beer, this is a great substitute. It kind of tastes like a cough medicine my mom would buy in the 90s, but not in a bad way. I don't get that, but that's fine. And also, my throat can't taste. My tongue can, <laughs> but I can't taste the back end of the drink. I can taste the front and the middle, but the back end where the vanilla comes in is just kind of dead right now. So I think if you like hop water, I think you'll like this. It is very complex in flavor. It's not just like water with some hops in it. There's actually depth and richness. I don't think it's really my cup of tea, but I'm tis. Hop tea. Hop tea. Uh, but I would recommend if you like the hop water. But yes, there's that first drink and the only drink this episode. So there you go. Um, what else have we been doing? I've given up based on Nick's recommendation of 100%ing Prey on my PS5. And I have moved on to playing through the Mass Effect series because I played one and two when they released way back in the day. And I haven't played them since and never played the third to experience the supposed terrible ending. So I beat the first game, forgot about how much fun it is, and I'm in the middle of the second game and forgot about how much of an improvement it is over the first one. And man, that game is still so good in so many ways. And uh, I'm excited to get through it and get to the third one. But that's currently my video game journey. Movie-wise, we have been very behind. Well, not behind. We haven't seen all the Oscar noms yet. But we did watch House. We did watch House from 1977, the Japanese horror film that is fantastic. It did have an 80s American remake that is very fun. But the 80s American remake feels like an 80s American horror comedy where the Japanese from 77 is very offbeat and hectic and chaotic in like the best way. And oh, absolutely. It's very fun. We really enjoyed it. It is like an anti-war anthem on an acid trip with a cat. It's weird. Just watch just it. Just watch it. Don't read into it. Just watch it. Don't read into it, but listen to our recommendations. You must watch it. It's in the Criterion Collection, so it at least has to be kind of okay, right? That's like... I feel like anything that makes it into Criterion is at least baseline okay. Yes. Like, it would never be bad, I like, think. I don't think there's an accurate way for us to really describe it and get across just no. how... Not without spoiling it all. ...amazing this is. So definitely go watch that. But you know what else we've watched, Delton? What? Pro Wrestling! We did. We went to Pro Wrestling in Tulsa. I was on TV! She was. We were on TV quite often, especially me because I'm tall-ish. I mean, I'm... 5'11 with a man bun, so basically, tender, six foot. basically six foot, because uh, the man bun. But there's a spot specifically, uh, I'm going to go into it, where Hangman puts Swerve into, into the announce desk, and the camera's basically looking right there at Hangman's face, and behind Hangman, you can just see Haley's head, like, smiling back in the crowd. I'm just smiling and clapping. We had second row floor seats for Tulsa at the BOK Center. Uh, our friend Eddie rode with us, and we met with our friend Kyle, who had never been... Uh, me and Kyle are kind of in a weird war of trading concert tickets. So he had a show and he had a, he got me a ticket and we went and then a concert came through and I got him a ticket and we've kind of been doing that. He got us Tool tickets. We got to see Tool, which I think I've talked about. Um, and this was the next one for me was I asked him, do you want to go to pro wrestling show with us? Because I'm getting tickets when they release and I'm getting good ones. And so we did. And it was a very, very fun time. And he was, I think, didn't expect it to be how it was but also did because <laughs> it's pro wrestling he described it s described his experience like this he said it's like going to another friend's church yeah there's a whole spectacle everyone knows all the rituals everybody knows what's going on but you like there's people that you're watching that are being adored and I was like, yeah, as a recovering Catholic, I think that's pretty accurate because there's many times where everybody stood together, everybody chanted, everybody sang along to a song, everybody knew what was going on. You could definitely tell those that were not... Uh, not indoctrinated. Not in, indoctrinated. Into the church of wrestling of brother. Wrestling brother. And so that was Kyle. So we tried to like give him some pointers and whatnot, and he was polite and observed, and I think he had a good time. I think he had an experience, and he also got to be on TV. I told him it's just the American Cirque du Soleil. Like, if you just take a bunch of dudes and say, hey, you guys, get real beefed up and slap each other. They're like, cool, make it acrobatic. Cool. 
and you're pretty much in. You just do the same with the ladies. Boom, you got a wrestling program. It's choreographed acrobatics. It's choreographed acrobatics. Someone can still die as we watched a lady get dumped on her head and was very scary. It was very scary. Like the um, doctor had to grab a water bottle from one of the announcer's desk and basically stabilize her to make sure she didn't die. Yeah, that's how you know. The, like the way you know that somebody took a very scary bump, which is what they call any kind of. If somebody hits you and you have to hit the mat, it's called taking a bump. If you take a very scary bump in the ring, it's when after the match is over and the commercials are on or they're in a backstage segment for the TV viewers, the crowd will clap for the person, especially if they're walking their own way out. Uh, It's very much like a show of respect of like, we understand what you're doing and this is very dangerous. I hope you're okay. And everybody immediately is just walking out like people are clapping and you could just tell that was scary. But yeah, we got to see that as well. We did. So if you want to see our lovely faces on TV, tune in to the Wednesday, February 21st show in Tulsa. You'll see our bright and smiling faces having a grand old time watching wrestling. AEW Dynamite on TBS. TBS. I had to think about it. And so aside from that, we've just been hanging out. We went to our friend's birthday party. We have watched some movies, as Delton has talked about. And just hung around playing with our fur babies and having a grand old time. Oh, here's the door. Uh, uh. It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So the game for this episode is Boop from Smirk and Dagger Games. Boop is a two-player, 20-minute time limit. Like it's a wrestling match. Uh, (laughs) 20-minute estimation on time. A two-player game about cats pushing each other around on top of the bed. Uh, The game is designed by Scott Brady. The graphic art and illustration is by Kurt Covert. Rules proofreading is Linda Baldwin. And I loved this. The lead playtesters and cheerleaders are Nicole, Madison, and Kennedy Brady. His family, sounds like, based on names. So Boop is a very simple two-player abstracted game with cats. So it's not extremely abstracted because cats. Uh, Essentially, there is a piece of fabric quilt that comes it's the game board it's literally like a little tufted quilt that you flip the box bottom over you put that quilt on top and boom you have a bed for the cats i believe it's a six by six it is a six by six grid and what happens is you will put a cat on the grid and by the cat i mean a kitten you put a kitten on the grid and your opponent puts a kitten on the grid when it's placed on the board next to other kittens those kittens that were already on the board are going to boop in the direction away from the most recently placed cat. So if I put a cat down in the middle, like in a spot, and north of that spot is immediately one of Haley's kittens, that one is going to scoot up one space. I imagine it like if you've ever had a cat who's just like under your feet, maybe you're cooking in the kitchen and the cat's just like hanging out under your feet and maybe you drop a spoon on the ground and it goes clang and cats stand up real straight and they just like... It's like someone like picks them up and moves them backwards two feet, like they bounce backwards. That little jump. That little jump. That's what it reminds me of. Whenever you place a kitten down, it makes all the other kittens go boop. The goal of the game is to be the winner of the game. And the way you do that is you have to have three cats on the board at the same time. Not kittens, but cats. Or all of your cats on the board. I should say, not three at the same time. Three cats in a row on the board. Or all of your cats on the board at the same time. So the way you do that is when you get three kittens in a row, they come off the board, and those three kittens now become cats. Then you have cats that you can put on the board. And it's going to go that way until somebody wins. The cats cannot be booped by kittens, but they can be booped by other cats, which makes them really nice to have like a a steady position on the board when your opponent is still working with a lot of kittens because they can't move that cat uh, anywhere. It's really simple. It is one of those, you put three things together, they turn into one kind of game where you put three together, they come off, they become three full-size cats in your supply. Then you can put them on the board and use them. And if you get three full-size cats in a row, like I said, you win the game. That's pretty much the whole game. There is a like simplified version for younger players on the back of the rule book that is basically saying, don't use the cats, just use the kittens. And it's the first to line up three kittens. Just makes it a little easier, a little simpler without the extra rule, but it's still the same game flow concept and everything like that. But I think that's how the entire game plays. I don't think there's really anything else to talk about aside from it's very cute. 
It's very cute and it's simple to play. I know that it's rated for as young as 10, but our friends Zach and Sarah actually got this for Christmas from one of Zach's co-workers, and they have been playing the simplified version with their four-year-old who has been engaging in it and really liking it and really liking to win too. Yes, exactly. And it's one that you can do that with multiple ages, and it's just a, it's a great game for that. And it's a good game if you like a little abstract puzzle, a little figuring out where someone's going to place something, especially when there's a lot of kittens on the board and you place one down and they boop the other ones out of the way. It changes the entire board state at a rate in which it's hard to plan too many moves ahead, more than maybe one or two, because it is a constantly changing board state when there's a lot. Absolutely. And you said that this was a re-implementation or a re-theme, right? It is a re-implementation of a game called Gekitai by the same designer. And that game basically is, it's the same thing, but with stones. You know, I always wonder, why do cats work so well as themes? Hey. What can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So Boob is definitely one of those games, I I guess I should have said, I bought it for Haley for Christmas? I don't know. I bought it for Haley for something, Christmas or birthday. Because you love me. I guess. But we've really enjoyed it. It's, It's simple. It's easy. It's cute. It's fun. It hits all those boxes. But one of the things that Haley brought up when we were discussing a topic for this episode was why cats? And not just because cats are cute, but why do cats work so well? Right, because there are lots of wonderful, furry, and feathery little creatures out there. And many are beloved as well. But why do cats work so well? And we wanted to look at this uh, beyond just, well, everyone on the internet loves cats and her da 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 you know, I was thinking about the actual creature of cats compared, so for example, compared to dogs. And I feel like cats are just more versatile. Like you can have a nice cat and a sweet cat, or you can have a complete asshole cat who scratches you and whatnot. And both are kind of seen as quirky or adorable as compared to if you were to have a dog with the same thing. So you can have a sweet dog, but if you have a mean or an ornery dog, and that's kind of seen as a negative thing. Almost. No offense to dogs. I love Marge. She's laying back here with me. And I just feel like cats have a different reputation that even whenever they're being little assholes, they're still adorable little assholes. Even whenever they're mean, they're still adorable mean little things. And so I think that that makes them more beloved and versatile as critters because cats, they can be fast. They can be agile. They can be lethargic. They can be cuddly. They can be cute. They can be mean. They can be scrappy. There's so much with cats that I feel like it makes it easier for them to be implemented in many different ways in games. I can see that because cats, cat personalities on a, I don't want to say a basic level. If you could, you could essentially make a pie chart of like, all right, cat personalities, not saying each individual cat, but cat personalities. And you, you could fill that pie chart with a number of slices of pie of different cat personalities. If you fill that pie chart with dog personalities, it is a more limited number, a lower, fewer different uh, pieces of pie. And I think that that holds up pretty well as a a thought I just had just now. Um, So I think that that's part of it is that, like you said, cats, there's the ornery cat, there's the cute cat, there's the soft cat, there's the cat that likes to lay on their back, there's the, and all of those hold true for, like one cat could have multiple of those moments. Steve? Yeah, but they could be, you know, split into a whole category of cat itself where dogs. Cat agory. Yeah, where dogs, you know, you've got the happy dog, you've got the dog with ears, you've got the, the licking dog, and like all of that makes sense. But at some point, you run out of good ideas that actually ring true to people, where with cats, it continues. And even if you get more and more ridiculous with that idea and more and more specific, with that cat personality, they're still going to ring true for a majority of people. So I feel like that helps anytime it comes to cat like personalities and personas. Personas. A. There's all kinds of cat puns. Well, like you think about the like there are dog games out there. Like we played the uh, what was it the the dog game at Nick and Jennifer's where you wanted to get their favorite food, their favorite kind of pets, and yeah. basically have all the dogs visit you. Like there's that game, and we have like Kung Fu, which is cat versus dog. But, like, you, you look at cats, and cats can be, it's, it's easy to make the cats ninjas because they are already little ninjas. Mm-hmm. It's easiest to put a cat on a quilt 
because cats are on quilts. Anyway, it's easy to uh, apply cats to something like this with boop, where, you know, if a cat, you know, boops another cat or jumps up next to him, cats get spooked and they, they boop themselves off. It's, it's easier, I feel like, to mold their personalities to these, to these themes. I feel like that's an insult. Like, hey, boop yourself out of here. Boop yourself out of here. Yeah, that's just, I just imagine cats getting in an argument. One's like, yeah, boop you. And that's just their language. But really, can you think of any other animal that's as versatile or that would be as easy to basically implement as a theme? Turtles. Tell me more about that. Ninja turtles. Yes, ninja that's, turtles. All it takes is some toxic waste and boom, you got ninja turtles. Is that what happened to me? Yep. That's where you came from. You got in some toxic waste as a kid, and they're like, man, this hairless rat sure got big. Well, this toxic <laughs> a childhood that I have, you'd think I'd have superpowers. Hey, 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 hey. Jeez. So coming back to when you were talking about, you know, the mean cat, the happy cat, all that kind of stuff, uh, one of the things, too, that we, we talked about a little before the show is just the perception of the mean cat, of how he's the little asshole kitty that just likes to be an asshole sometimes, but you still love him, versus the mean dog that is a lot scarier and not as cute. And there's there's something there, I think, too, of why cats are more versatile is, again, it's their personalities are so fickle. Like, they're such weird little shits that they flip it on and off when they want. But a mean cat, as truly traumatizing as that can be, doesn't come close in the even the imagery used in advertising with a mean dog, which is used to represent actual, like, uh, angry photos and stuff. And I feel like that comes into play that we perceive angry cats or mean cats as these cute little shits where a mean dog's not seen in the same light. Yeah. And so for theming purposes, like cats, even whenever they're mean, they're still seen as good or they're still seen as fun or they're, they're like I said earlier, quirky is what are palatable than mean dogs. And then for the actual mechanics of the game, they're a lot more versatile because again, they can run and they can jump. They can lay around. They can be sneaky. Like, there's so many components to a cat's personality that this lend to it being used as a board game theme. I think it's just because since cats are liquid physically, they're also liquid thematically. Yes. And so they just work. They're versatile because they're liquid. They fit in any container you give them. They exist in all states. Sometimes they're solid. Sometimes they're gas. Sometimes they're ashes in a box on your bookshelf. Womp, womp, womp. Steve. All right, pee and peace. I also think something that makes cats such a versatile animal for all these different board games is not only their personalities, but I think it's the commonality in the different activities of cats. All cats like to just bat things around goofily and knock things off of a counter. That's just, I've never met a cat that won't just walk up to a bottle cap or something on the desk and just kind of push it off until it's in the floor. You're like, what are you doing, you dick? And that's just how cats are. And I think that. Like the a mixture of that, the fact they like to hide and do the little butt calibration wiggle before they jump at stuff. So many of those things are just exactly every single cat ever that it's an easy thing that not only do we enjoy it, but it's also these fun little things you can incorporate in your game in some manner. And uh, everyone knows it. And everyone knows it. Everyone knows a cat's going to use a litter box. So that could be used. Everyone knows that cats love fish. I mean, you watch, given you're not supposed to give cats dairy, please don't give cats dairy. They will have diarrhea. But you watch Tom and Jerry, which you know I used to watch as a kid, and they always gave like milk. If the cat had milk, that was his favorite thing. And in how many games is milk like one of the little cat treats or the cat food or something? Like Cat Lady from AEG, milk is one of the ingredients that you want for the cat. And I think that just all of those commonalities that we love and everybody knows makes it easy to incorporate cats because if you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to incorporate this special, uh, what's the, like, aquatic iguana? Like, nobody knows about those. They swim and they're iguanas. Uh, that would be hard to make a game that's as, I mean, given, I would totally play a game about iguanas and other reptilian creatures. Is that an amphibian? No, they're a reptile, but they swim. So that's I, I don't know what you're talking about. So <laughs> There's the iguanas that swim. And I was saying, is that a reptile or an amphibian because they swim? I know it's just a reptile, but it's just a funny question. It's a reptile I'm house. being dumb. I'm saying please make a board game about iguanas, but also it just wouldn't hit the same for people. It would be cute artwork. It wouldn't be I understand why that artwork is that way. That makes sense? Yeah, and then if you think about using dogs too, like there's dogs have so much variety between them. Like there's Chihuahua versus Rottweiler. 
or you know whatever a marge is versus a a corgi there's so much differences in their personalities and what they do and what they like but cats are just standard issue cats cats are cats cats going to cat so i think that cats in the end cats work because they are quirky there's a lot of versatility in their actions and even whenever they're bad cats are perceived as good which makes them more palatable in a theme that is my thesis and i stick to it and so speaking of cats let's go into the question of the episode and now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special, Bite Size Question. So, the question for this episode is what game would you want to re-theme into Cats? Definitely Escape. Okay, so instead of Escape, Curse of the Temple, what would it be? It would be Escape, Curse of the Water Bottle. And so what I imagine is, instead of trying to roll your die in order to you know, collect gems or get enough torches in order to, uh, you know, unlock more things. You are rolling die, trying to basically place your bets on how much water can I drink from the sink before I get the water bottle squirted on me? How much of the, you know, Thanksgiving turkey dinner can I munch on before the family comes back from the holiday picture? And that's kind of what your time limits are. You're in different parts of the house that you can go to. You got to explore all parts of the house. One of the rooms, there's a sink running, you get water. One of the rooms, there's a big turkey on the table you got to eat. One of the rooms, there is a, you know, bunch of uh, presents that you're, have, you're wanting to get into. And you have to go in there, accomplish your thing, eat a bunch of turkey, drink a bunch of sink water, unwrap a whole bunch of presents, and then make it back to your place before the family gets in. I'm in. It makes perfect sense. And then the little icon on the dice and the back of the tiles, instead of being two running men, it's just the, like, when cats run away from something and they're just sliding because they just won't skittering, they just skitter across the hard floor because they won't put their claws <laughs> away like Steve used to do. Uh, it's that. They're, it's just that symbol of them like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, <laughs> trying so hard to go fast but moving nowhere for a second. That's perfect. I thought so. What about you, Delty Poo? I'm gonna do Preda Porter, but instead of coming up with outfits to design. You're coming up with different grooming techniques like the lion cut and the faux poodle and all these different ways to groom cats. I love it. That's my that's my thought there. I was because I love that I looked at it and said that. And then you said, "Ooh, this. And I was just like, no, that's mine. So Haley was on the same page. She was close, but she didn't keep didn't didn't guess the exact thing I was thinking. But we were almost there. But yes, that's my answer for a cat retheme. We need Preda Porter. But you're designing amazing grooming. Just like Penny and her and her little plushy cut. And her ridiculous plushy lion cut. But I think that's going to do it for this episode and my ability to sit here any longer and sniffle and cough off mic. So thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Malthouse Games podcast. Thank you to our Patreon patrons that back us at a level in which they get shouted out on the podcast. So thank you so much to Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff. Thank you to all the other amazing patrons that support us at any level, you can be like them if you'd like and go to patreon.com slash Malthouse Games. You can also find us on all social media at Malthouse Games. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-K. That is at Squirrely Geek. You can always send us an email, contact at malthousegames.com if you have a game you think we should look at, a topic you want us to talk about, a question for us to answer, or a beer or drink that you think we should seek out for the podcast. Uh, that is contact at malthousegames.com, but there is now no longer a malthousegames.com. I hadn't made that announcement that we stopped paying for that <laughs> because it was uh, a little pricey for the basically the amount of work it took to upkeep because it was very inefficient on the website. But all that stuff being said, it's fine. Another iteration will come one day. One day we will get back to that. For now, email is still the easiest contact and social media is the best. Haley's is at Squirrely Geek. I don't know if I said that. I can't remember. Hopefully after Delty edits this episode, it's longer than 14 minutes whenever he edits out his coughs. But poor Delton, he has not been feeling very well. So thank you so much, Delty, for powering through this episode, drinking your hop water and your antibiotics. Yeah, the, today's definitely the best day. Like yesterday was a lot better than the few before. Today's way better than that. It's just that when the allergies kick in with it and it starts getting some drainage, it's just not a good time. So. 
He's hmm. allergic to Oklahoma. I'm allergic to Oklahoma and our weather change. We should talk about our weather change for two seconds. It was like 75, and then it was 50. Today it was like 44 and snowing and sleeting and raining, and then this weekend's going to be like 80. Yes. So it's all over the place. It doesn't know what it wants to do, and I hate it. <laughs> But I think that's everything. So thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the podcast, listening to us yap and cough off screen. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe and reach out via email or social media or whatever other manner you would like. Don't forget that we also have a uh, Discord for Patreon users and people. If you want it, just hit me up and I'll see what I can do about getting you in the Discord. It's not super active, but we are there and I check it a lot, even if I don't type a lot. I think that does it. Thank you again for listening. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. See you folks later. Goodbye. Bye.